Hi, this is Greg Hill with WeAreChangeVictoria.org and Freedom Free For All TV. We're here at Camosun College with David Lindsay. He's the keynote speaker at this uh, day and a half long seminar. David, thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. I'm glad we're here. So uh, maybe you could give a cr brief description. What's going on here today? Why is it important? Um, it's important because we're discussing a lot of um, a lot of issues on property rights, and um, a lot of people have forgotten that property is a constitutional protection in Canada. And our goal is to show people where in in, uh, in our constitution that property is protected, and how that relates to the fact that we do not have to pay income tax in Canada. And we, we try and teach people that income tax and non-payment of income tax is not the end to the to the, to uh, the end goal. The end goal is to eliminate the usury system and money system in Canada. And um, basically to do that, you have to cut off their, their, their money supply. So we talk about the coronation oath of the Queen, which is part of our constitution, and how she has promised to protect our property rights, including our money and our labor. And she is not doing that. And that forms the basis of why you have the constitutional protection and the constitutional right not to pay income tax, to keep your money and your property that she promised to protect and to refuse to support a, a criminal money system. And, and how long have you been involved in, in this type of work? I've been involved now 23 years. And, and, and what makes uh, this work sig significant to you and uh, the, the work that you've done? I suppose one could say it's a calling. I, I was basically led and I was told to go on this path in life and I have uh, I've fulfilled it and I will probably continue this path for the rest of my life and you know what? It's like any parent who wants to look after the best for their children all their life. They're, it's nothing that ends when they're 10 years old. They do it for their entire life. And our goal is the same thing with our, with our organizations. And um, freedom is a generational struggle. And it's, it's, it's a legacy that I'm going to leave to, to my family and, and hopefully all our friends with it. So what would you say to people that weren't able to make it to the seminar this weekend? What would you tell the audience uh, at home? I would think it's important to know that we have property rights that exist independent of the Charter but still in our Constitution, that the, you do not want to get property rights enshrined in the Charter or eventually they will end, you'll end up losing them. And most importantly, they need to know how our coronation oath protects Christian principles and how that forms and has been agreed upon that it forms a constitutional protection that you can rely upon to refuse to comply with any government statute that violates Christian principles. And I think that's absolutely criti critical in today's day and age. What's your favorite short book or short read that you could recommend to the, to the viewers? Um, on the money system, I think an excellent read would be Billions for the Bankers and Debts by the, uh, debts, Billions for the Bankers and Debts for the People by uh, Joe Thauberger from Saskatchewan. And it was an awesome little book on, on, how the, um, on how the money system works, especially how usury is involved in it. And um, that would probably be one of the best little books on, on the money system. For sure. You also talked about uh, Frederick Bastiat. Yes, um, his book on, 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 the, on the law, it's called The Law, is probably the best book ever written. And it's free of charge, you can get it online. And it's just called The Law by Frederick Bastiat. It was written about 300 years ago. And it's a critical read, it's only 60 pages. But it's, prob it's probably the best read that anybody could have. It, it tells you exactly what is happening in society today and how our governments have simply passed statutes to authorize their criminal behavior and then rely upon those statutes to say what we're doing is lawful. And he goes in a lot of detail in explaining how governments are going to use criminal propaganda and procedures to take away your rights. And it just elaborates on everything that is happening today. It's without a doubt the best book anybody can read. That is brilliant. Again, this is Greg Hill with We Are Change Victoria. David, where can people find more information? Our email is clear, C-L-E-A-R, at clearfreedom.org. And we can be reached as well through your organization. Fantastic. And if you'd like some more information at home, please reach out to us, wearechangevictoria.org, and let us know, uh, and we can share more about how you can get involved. Thank you so much, David. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome to Freedom Free For All Television. I'm Paul Stein from WeAreChangeVictoria.org. Freedom Free For All TV is a community access television show um, that is focused on alternative media, most likely that you will not hear on corporate mainstream media. Today on our show, we've got David Kevin Lindsay, and he's from 
the Common Law Education and Rights Initiative. Welcome to the show, David. How are you doing? Great, thank you. Good. Um, so I guess maybe you can start off by saying, uh, describing what the Common Law Education and Rights Initiative, or other, otherwise known as CLEAR, what that's all about. We started off in the Okanagan, I guess close to 10 years ago now, and um, it was a follow-up on groups we had had elsewhere in Western Canada. And our main objective was to educate Canadians on the fraudulent banking system we have in Canada right now, and specifically with the federal government who um, issues the nation's monetary supply at interest, compound interest, which is contrary to our established law over the last millennia. And that was our original objective, and still is, mm -hmm. is to educate Canadians on how um, the money system has to get changed in order for everything else to change in Canada. And until the money system is changed, uh, basically we, we educate Canadians that change in other aspects of life is not going to happen. And then from there we, we would talk about solutions on how to cut off the funding to the government, so mainly through income tax, of course, um, specifically to ensure that, that we can get Canadians to send a message that way your money system has to get changed. And we have several really solid bases in law as to why income tax is unlawful that we, uh, that we actively educate people on as well. Okay, well that's great. Um, I guess for the benefit of our viewers, most people do not know who you are, so mm -hmm. maybe for the benefit of the viewers, you could uh, tell a, a little bit about who you are, where you hail from, where you're from, sure. and kind of uh, what got you motivated to do these seminars. Sure. Um, I got motivated in Winnipeg about 23 years ago. Um, there was a publication out of Rougemont, Quebec, called the Michael Journal, and they had sent out a newsletter, I think it was about 11 million they sent out, and it went to every house in Canada or at least it was supposed to, depending on Canada Post, of course. Yes. But uh, I was one of the fortunate people in Winnipeg that received this newsletter. And I kind of kicked it around the house for about a month. And there was an article in there that was talking about why income tax was unlawful in Canada. And I finally got around to reading it, and my first view was, this is probably somebody out of eastern Canada or somewhere else that... Uh, if, if what they were teaching was wrong, there'd be no way of me to contact them or hold them accountable or anything else. But as I read it, I realized uh, the, uh, the end of the article pointed out that the author was a Winnipegger as well. So I contacted him, went over to his house. They were advertising a couple of books called uh, Call It Extortion, dealing with former Winnipegger Jerry Hart and his success at 40 years of non-payment of income tax, hmm. personally and at his business. And some of the humorous stories he had to keep CRA off his property, which were, which were quite good and in, in innovative, I might add. Yeah. And um, they, they spent five hours answering all my questions that night. And I picked up a copy of their book and read it and uh, realized very quickly, um, my first thought was, great, I don't have to pay income tax. Within about six to eight months or so, I, I realized that, that was not the issue. Uh, I, I said to uh, my friends, I said to them, you know, how is everything going to get paid for without an income tax? And he handed me a little book. It was called Billions for the Bankers and Debts for the People, uh, which was a Canadian publication, talking on the money system. Mm -hmm. And I read it, and I realized right away at that point forward, we did not need income tax to run the country. It was a banking problem. Hmm. And I started doing my own research on, on income tax after that, and I spent years, years in, a, in the law libraries doing, doing research. And This is probably before the internet as well, right? That was before the internet, um, where most of it had to be done by physically going to the library and, and reading. Wow. And um, I, I was fortunate. I was able to, to go everywhere from Dalhousie, out east in the Maritimes, right here to Victoria, at, at libraries right across Canada to do my research. And that's where you get your documentation from, in other words? Correct. Um, when uh, Jean Chrétien was Prime Minister, I was making inquiries through him and um, I got permission from him to actually go into the parliamentary archives. And I was the only one in Canada that they've told me has ever been let in there. Wow. They, uh, they weren't too happy with some of my inquiries and they just kind of said, here, go there and make your inquiries there. So it, uh, it was, it, it's been a long journey, 23 years, mm -hmm. and um, I'm just happy that the people I met invested that first five hours to answer all my questions that, that I had. And from there, it was just doing my own research, and uh, I made my decision. I was never going to look back. 
That's pretty cool. Um, so I guess you've been doing this for 23 years, you say, and you've got a lot of courtroom experience, a lot of legal knowledge. However, you're not a lawyer, though. Correct? That's correct. I'm not. But you have studied law, and you do continue to study law today. Correct. And, and, and you give seminars, which is why you're here in Victoria. Yeah. Uh, you're going to give a presentation November 1st and 2nd here in Victoria, basically regarding constitutional property rights, personhood, the hierarchy of law in Canada, uh, and a lot of other things. Now, personally... Um, I didn't get introduced to law courses until I took business class and I got straight A's in it and I, I really excelled at it and I said, hey, I'd like to take more business law classes. They said, you can't do that. You got to go to UVic to go study law. Um, for the benefit of the viewers, can you explain what this seminar is really all about uh, in a nutshell? Sure. In a, in a nutshell, um, our goal is to show people constitutionally, probably from a perspective most have never even considered how and why income taxes is, uh, is unconstitutional and how you can make the determination legally constitutional lawfully i should say constitutionally speaking to not support our government in their criminal activities including the banking industry and it's it's kind of a story we started at a constitutional basis showing where in our constitution it allows you explaining how the authorities to back it up and from there we go into property issues because people have to realize that property includes, it's not defined as most people think it, it, it is defined, and it includes a lot more than people realize is, in, is, is encompassed in it. For example, property includes your labor, your time, your skills, your knowledge, things that most people would not even consider as being their property. So we define constitutionally what property is, and even though it's not in the Charter, I will show you where property rights are located in our Constitution. And I, I know there is a group an organization out east uh, of former government officials who are trying to get property rights enshrined in the Charter. And I am actively advocating people not to do that. The minute property is enshrined in the Charter, it will become, it will become subject to Section 1, the, uh, the override That's clause. Right. Yeah. And then what will happen over the next 20, 30 years, the courts in Canada will carve out so many exemptions to it. They'll say, yes, you have property rights, but in a free and democratic society, it's for the betterment, betterment of everybody that you lose them in this case. And they'll have so many cases like that, that property will be almost meaningless. Hmm. Whereas where I'm going to show you where property rights exist right now, they cannot do that. And they cannot, there are no exemptions. You have property rights and Her Majesty has sworn an oath to protect them. And we're going to talk about that oath as being part of our constitution and what duties are involved on the monarch. They cannot give royal assent to any legislation that Parliament happens to come up with. Mm -hmm. And that includes the Governor General and the Lieutenant Governor of the provinces. And so we'll talk about that and how property affects your ability not to have to pay income tax. And then we get into personhood, which is basically kind of the means people still believe on, the, on um, in regular grammar that a person and a man are synonymous or mm -hmm. identical. And they are absolutely far from it. Mm -hmm. We have got the most comprehensive law in Canada to show that a person and a man are not only different in law, but the ability to be a person and have rights and duties is completely voluntary and, and upon the individual man or woman. And we will go through probably at least 150 slides showing people the authorities in Canadian law to support what I'm saying. Everything will, will, will be there. It's, uh, it's got about 15 years of research and we have documents right from King's Councils in England admitting that a person and a man are not the same in law and how the judges are and, and the lawyers are pulling a real fast one over the Canadian public. Wasn't there a legal maxim that says something like uh, every man is a person but not every person is a man That's or something correct. of that nature? Yes. And when I first read that it was very confusing because everybody thinks that a person is a human being, is, is a person, which it is partially I guess. It's, it's, it's a little bit of a story. I guess you got to learn a little bit about personhood to understand the complexity of how the legal term person applies to us. Um, so you've been doing this for quite a long time and this seminar is going to show us a little bit more of like the hierarchy of law in yes. order for us to understand how these laws apply to us. Because if we don't understand the hierarchy of orders then you really, you're really taking orders for you don't know where they're coming from. You don't know where the authority of those orders come from. So I guess you're going to kind of explain more of the hierarchy of law. So where we as citizens can kind of look to and say, well, how does this law apply to us? Is that absolutely? Correct? We're going to uh, people still were raised with an idea. A lot of people that parliament is supreme, and its supremacy is relative. It's not absolute. 
it's in, in relation to other powers that are lower than it. But Parliament itself cannot do whatever it wants. And the actual term is called <coughs> Her Majesty the Queen in Right of Parliament. And Her Majesty cannot pass laws on her own, and Parliament cannot pass laws on their own. They need each other. Mm -hmm. And so we will talk about not only the hierarchy in law, but who came first. I mean, yeah. we were created first by God, and that's who our law recognizes, is the supremacy of the individual, not the collective. That's right. And then we talk about how the queen came on the scene, and the king or the monarch, to get their powers to tell us what to do, and how parliament came about, and talk about these, these, uh, the order that they go in, and what powers they have. Because the judges, for example, are further down, even though they're agents of, of the queen, they're further down the list. And of course, police, although they exercise the most might is right power, yeah. legally speaking, they're further down right toward the bottom. So it's important for Canadians to know who has the power to pass laws, what their limits are, where those limits come from. That's right. And, and what and what they cannot do. And we will be showing Canadians in detail exactly that, uh, that hierarchy. So you're actively doing this across Canada. You're visiting other cities. You've been doing this for quite some time. What do you think the, uh, in your experience, what, have, what has been your experience from this? Like, do you find more and more people are coming to your seminars? Do you find uh, there's mis, mis, mixed feelings? or? I don't find any mixed feelings. I find that there are a lot of people in Canada who really need information. Um, there was an article a little while back, um, an organization which escapes me now and I forgot, is mentioning that there was about 30,000 people that were involved in freedom issues in Canada and I think it's more double that. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's probably 60, 70,000 people in Canada or more who actively know income tax is wrong and they know the banking system is wrong. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are just scared to come out of the woodwork. Absolutely. And when they realize that other people are talking about it, and not just other people, but there's credibility to what other people are saying. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things we want to establish by talking to Canadians is credibility. And as a result, virtually every source of information we have is listed when we talk to the people at, at our events. So people can take the information and, and go out to the libraries and they can verify it themselves. That's important. Absolutely it is. It was important when I got involved because I wanted credibility. If, if somebody was going to say income tax was wrong, it wasn't enough to say, here's your theory behind it. I needed some law or authorities to back it up so that I would be able to argue it myself or at least know what I would believe in. And that's what we want to instill on people as well. All our slides tell people, here's where the information is. You can go and verify it as well. That's interesting. Well, a lot of, there is some misconception out there, I think. There's, uh, I've, at least I've noticed that, that the media will um, basically demonize anybody that says they're studying law or they're part of the freedom movement or whatever it is and it, they kind of um, put people into a group and, and kind of box them in um, in which they then then demonize them as the enemy or whatever um, so when I hear a lot of people talking about freedom and income tax in particular um, I think the the conditioned response is to say, oh, you're a cheat, you're a cheater, you're, you're scamming the system, that's not fair, you're not paying your fair share in taxes. Um, would you like to set the record straight on exactly um, what you mean by not paying income tax? Well, I haven't filed a return since 1996. And one has to understand that you don't need taxes to run the country, specifically income tax, if I can refer to that. We had social programs, we had Army, Navy, infrastructure, all of that before the first income tax uh, came out in 1917. We had all of this. The amount of money being raised in income tax right now is roughly the equivalent to what is being paid in interest every day, every year on the amount the government borrows. Yeah, that's right. And they could be issuing the, the nation's money through the Bank of Canada without interest, and you wouldn't even need an income tax. And most Canadians have no idea uh, about that issue. So our, our goal and our objective is to educate Canadians on that. And I think that the majority of Canadians, they're just scared. And they need to know some information. And our goal is to get that information out to them. Um, we're getting more and more Canadians, more and more people are interested, especially online. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's going to be very, very important for them to see where that information is coming from. So I guess the, another question that follows up then is, if you're not paying your taxes, if you're not paying your fair share, and if everybody decides to stop paying income tax, how are the roads going to be you know, fixed? How is, how is our doctors going to be paid? How are the police going to be paid? How is our society going to run? That's the common question I get 
whenever I talk about income tax or taxation to anyone, really, it's we have these kind of what I say, these preconditioned responses that say, well, then how, how is our country going to run? So what is your reply to that? Well, several. Number one, we don't need the majority of people that are working in governments today anyway. There's a lot of redundancy and a lot of uh, government jobs that are out there. People see people, men and uh, government officials working on highways, and they don't realize the, the horrible job these guys do, and they have to go back frequently, two and three and four times to do the same job that should have been done right the first time. Mm -hmm. So the costs are really uh, just phenomenal compared to what it should be. So in addition to a lot of the people that are working in governments that don't even need to be there, I think a lot of Canadians um, just know that something's wrong. If you get rid of income tax, if you get rid of the usury system and you eliminate income tax, people will be able to keep their money. And people that are happy, keep their money, are happy. And those people don't commit crimes. Yeah. And if they can keep all their money, they'll be able to provide for their own services. We don't need what is commonly called the modern welfare state, mm -hmm. which is basically a form of socialism. Yes. And I, I emphasize we should go back to having a system where the people can make their money and keep it. And then they can provide for themselves and determine their health care choices and, and so on. People today are accustomed to thinking that they have to look to the government to solve all their problems. And we have to get away from that, that belief that they're there to solve all, solve all our problems. So when we talk about, um, for example, somebody says, you have to pay your fair share. What is your fair share? Who determines what your fair share is going to be? Some government who's making, an official who's making 150 grand a year. And that money, uh, the example I used to use uh, a few years ago, Canada gave, I think, uh, $500 million to, to help bail Greece out. And what if your fair share goes all over to Greece? It's, it's formed into the same consolidated revenue fund. And what if that all went to Greece? None of that money would have got spent in Canada. Your fair share includes monies that go to pay for a lot of government activities that are constitutionally and criminally unlawful. Mm -hmm. And I'm simply not going to support those, uh, those things. So when you realize the government spends a lot of money on criminal activities that they shouldn't be doing, that you don't need all that money to run the country, um, and you don't even need the income tax to, to provide for the goods and services. And when people can keep it, not only can they keep all the fruits of their labor, but they can make their own choices in life as to what to do. Uh, people will be quite happy and realize we don't need income tax to run the country, and there is no such thing as fair share. That's just a myth defined by defined by uh, by government officials to lead people to believe that you know everybody has to pay taxes for for uh, for doing things. And when you would realize how the money system works, that's just simply not true. But isn't it true that income tax goes to pay the roads and the the, the no. health care and everything else? No, income tax primarily goes to pay interest on the debt. Right now, Canada has a 565 roughly billion dollar debt. Out of that debt, only 40 billion is principal. All the rest is compound interest. And that does not include provincial, it does not include municipal, and it does not include personal. Personal debt right now is about a dollar 60 for every man and woman in Canada compared to every dollar they bring in. Wow. And when you add municipal, provincial, and federal debts, it's mathematically impossible to ever pay that debt off. And that's all taxes do, it's just further the debt year after year so that those people, I mean, the, the, the debtor is in, in servitude to the creditor, yeah. who are the banks. So they're telling your government what to do and what priorities they can do and what they can build behind the scenes. And generally speaking, it has nothing to do with you. Once governments get your money, and it, in, in reality it's a debt to Her Majesty, once they get your money, it's like putting it in the bank, it's no longer yours and you have no control over what happens to that money and you have no say in the matter. And the majority of it goes to pay interest on, on debt. So, that, so, so in all actuality, the majority of income tax actually pays off the, net, the, the, the interest off of our national debt. Correct. And it's not even going to the principal. That's correct. And, and the debt has been the same for years, and it's just going to keep getting higher and higher. Um, I know for uh, some statistics I saw, for example, on the roads, they were collecting $5 billion a year in, in uh, fuel taxes. Mm -hmm. And out of that $5 billion, only $300 million went on the roads. So where'd the rest go? They went into general funds and who knows where it went. Most likely to pay interest on bankers again. That's where a lot of the money goes. But can you imagine if $5 billion was spent on the roads, what it was designed for, for fuel taxes, for example? Well, that would last oh. how many years? 20 years? Absolutely. Right? And you'd be doing, you can get quality work out of it yeah. and, and you know, repair the highways once. And they could last dozens of years. Mm -hmm. 
But well, I know there's a lot of monetary activists uh, here in BC. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul Grignon is one of them. He made money as debt. He explained the money system pretty nicely. Uh, Will Abram was um, yes. a monetary activist. I interviewed him and he showed me a graph about the ex exactly what you're talking about, how the principal and the interest, uh, I think the interest was closely, close to 60% of what the principal was. And uh, th that's pretty much all that was paying off. So I know there's a lot of people that do talk about the money system and how money is the fundamental, I guess, the bottom of the rabbit hole when you're talking about taxation and the problems that we're in in this, in this world. Yes. Um, I kind of want to switch the topic a little bit because there's been a lot of topic, a lot of talk on the media, in the media about uh, free men on the land. Um, and it seems to be very gray. A lot of people don't know. Again, they say free men on the land and all of a sudden everybody who talks about tax or freedom, again, is pooled into this profiling group. And that's who you must be. You must be one of those people. Um, I guess there was a case that came out of Alberta called Meads versus Meads. I think it's about a year old. Yeah. And you were mentioned in there as being one of the gurus of this freedom movement. Um, what do you have to say about that? And do you, would you call yourself a free man on the land? I am not a free man on the land. I'm not part of their organization. Um, I, don't, I have never had a membership with them and never have been a part of their organization. But to say, uh, number one, there, there's a lot of groups in Canada as well. They're not the only ones that are advocating freedom. I share a lot of their views, a lot I don't, mm -hmm. that I don't share. Um, but I think that what the government is doing is the, um, with any legitimate organization, especially something that's a threat to their power structure, their criminal power structure over us, they are going to use every weapon possible to come after us. And mm -hmm. what they do is they'll take a fringe element out of whoever's opposing them and try to make them look bad and then use guilt by association. They will label that organization with a lot of false names and they'll put it out through the media who will generally put out everything the government tells them to put out in the terms they want. And, uh, and then they try and associate everybody with it. So people hear about free men and they think anybody who's talking on freedom issues now is part of this free men on the land movement. And they put out the theories that some people hold and they don't explain them in the media what they are. For example, they will come up and say, these people are trying to tell everyone that you don't need a driver's license. Mm -hmm. And people go, wow, that's a Nazi need a driver's license. Because the statute says you have to have one. But a lot of people fail to explain why you don't need a driver's license, where that principle came from, originated, and how this highway system is supposed to work without having a driver's license or registration insurance and everything else. Um, we, we, issues like that, we try to deal with that in that context. We explain why you don't need a driver's license, although we're not talking about it at our, at our conference. We, we have written a book called Rights Denied on why you don't need driver's licenses and the law to back it up. And it goes back to the right to the free use of the public highways. Yeah. And that right, to, <coughs> excuse me, that right doesn't matter how you're traveling. Car, horse, buggy, it doesn't matter. It's the right of free travel. Mm -hmm. that, that is imperative. And so we try and teach people that here is where the right came from. Here are your duties. And here is why they cannot do license and registration. And here's how the system should work where people will travel safely. And here's how it will work where they will be held accountable. Because everybody thinks if you don't have a license plate, if there's going to be hit and runs and nobody can find anybody. They always look at the worst case scenario. Right now, according to their stats, it's about 15% of the people on the highway don't have insurance for one reason or another. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. And we try and teach people that uh, on that issue alone, the, the law behind it and why you don't need licensing and registration and to say you're not going to be at danger w without it. And that goes the same with income tax and other matters. Mm -hmm. I think that's where we try to differentiate ourselves in, in a lot of ways in the sense that we don't just come up and say income tax is illegal mm -hmm. or unlawful. We will say it's unconstitutional and here's why. And here's the supporting documents and law to back it up. And we will provide that to everybody. So the media generally doesn't want to, hasn't really touched our group very much. They came up to me once and I turned them down because they really do misrepresent everything. Mm -hmm. In one of my court cases I was involved in on income tax, CRA issued a press release. The uh, local uh, paper, Penticton Herald, they printed the CRA press release word for word. And all they did was just change the headline to say Penticton Herald. Of course. And the, the, the interesting part is that not one member of the Penticton Herald ever came to any of my court hearings. 
They were never there. They never uh, saw anything in the court file. They didn't talk to anybody. They just got a press release from CRA, printed it in the paper, word for word, and attached their name to it. And if anybody reads newspapers across Canada, even the National News, you'll see that the same articles are, are almost the same in every paper in Canada. Nothing really changes. Yeah. Because they're all ran by two or three people. That's right. And they're told, this is what you're going to write, and we're going to write what the government tells us so we don't get audited and we don't have problems. And, and people, as a result, they see the same articles on a repetitive basis put up by the RCMP and the CRA and so on, and they see them all over Canada, and it's just a form of brainwashing. Yeah. They label you as a detaxer or a free man or a tax protester. They just find these labels, and they just they hit on them time and time again. You're a tax protester. You're a tax. What is a tax protester? Anybody in Canada, I think everybody in Canada is a tax protester because they all hate paying tax, <laughs> and and they all they just hate it with a passion. Yeah. So they can classify everybody as that, but they come up with their own definition of what a taxpayer is, and then they do guilt by association. And that you, stifles people from learning yeah. this information because it's a it's a red flag right off the bat. You it's don't want to talk to that guy because he's going to drag you down or somehow you know get you in trouble, right? Yeah. And I guess that comes up to my next question. You've been in some legal trouble. Yep. Uh, you've you've um, not filing returns, not driving without a license. Um, do you want to quickly explain sure. that those charges, how this trouble has actually gained you knowledge? Yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't say I've been in legal trouble. I don't consider it trouble. Yeah. I consider it a challenge. Yeah. Good. Um, back in 2003, they laid a charge of failing to file income tax returns for not filing for five five years. Mm -hmm. And um, I took them through the courts and it, it went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. They refused to have to hear it. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what's been interesting is despite the fact that I filed a 200 plus page written argument that listed all the law to back it up and it took me two full days to explain it to the judge, the Crown in response to that had two and a half pages, and and they just ignored everything. And I'm talking from a legal perspective. I'm not talking calling them names, an ad hominem attack, or or just arguments that are going around in circles. I'm talking a concerted legal argument that took me nine months to prepare. Mm -hmm. And the judge, in his decision, used three paragraphs, and he said, on the issue of personhood, he said, I agree with CRA when they said that, uh, or with he says I agree with David that um, the term person does not include a man or woman in the act. But he said, I agree with CRA official uh, when she assumed it to be that. Hmm. And that was basically his, his comment. And at the higher courts, when I appealed, their position was, we're just not going to deal with that. And same with the coronation oath. They just said, we're not going to deal with it. But I refused to file. The judge issued a fine and a compliance order to file. And I refused to file. So they laid another charge this time, uh, the same section, 238 of the Income Tax Act, of failing to comply with an order, a court order to file this mm -hmm. time. And I went through the trial process, and I told the judge the same position. Listen, you have an oath of office and an oath of allegiance to Her Majesty, and you cannot enforce these statutes, the Income Tax Act, because they violate Her Majesty's coronation oath, which is part of our Constitution. And this is what you teach at your seminars. That's correct. And their position is, the previous course, courts didn't want to talk about it because they don't have an answer to it. Mm -hmm. They're boxed in a corner they can't get out of. So they didn't want to deal with it. We're not going to, so the Judge DeWall said the same thing, we're not going to deal with it. And he went and entered a conviction anyway. But what was interesting is the Income Tax Act requires, upon conviction, a minimum mandatory $1,000 fine. That's minimum, and, and the judge has no discretion. He does have a discretion to issue a compliance order again. Mm -hmm. And the Crown always asks for one, and they always get it, because yeah. why charge them if, if exactly. they're going to walk away, right? So in my case, the judge put me in jail. I spent 40 days in jail, and there was no fine issued. Hmm. The judge ignored the act. He did not issue a fine, and he never issued a compliance order. So it's done with. It's done. They cannot lay charges. In effect, I won. Hmm. But that goes to the same issue with all freedom. Freedom comes with a bit of a sacrifice because there's always crooks that are trying to take it away from you, primarily governments and bankers. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a sacrifice. Absolutely. So I spent 40 days in jail, and I never filed the returns. They never got them. And to this day, even though it's been two years after that or a year and a half after that, 
they've never served me any more notices to file. They basically said, you know, we don't want to deal with that guy again. And that's what I'm going to be teaching people over the next couple of days, how I got to that level. Because if you think you're going to walk into court with an arrogant attitude and say, hey, I got this document, you can, you know, you, you can, you can win in my favor and, and that's it. You're going to be in for a surprise because the judges are not your friends. Yeah. And I have seen so much from these judges over the years that so many of them should be in, really should be incarcerated. And a lot of them are compromised. Mm -hmm. They're politically appointed, non-elected, and they're not accountable to anybody except their own internal peer review system. Mm -hmm. That's it. And we teach people, you're not going to win in the courts. Um, the reason I can say I won is because they don't want me back there. And the majority of people don't have 15 years of legal knowledge and experience that I've learned and, and able to get. Or do they have the money to hire a lawyer that's going to back them up for how many years a court case takes and you know thousands yeah. of dollars that it costs. And a lot of lawyers don't have this knowledge. And yeah. as it, it was interesting in a, a friend's case I was helping years ago, the judge asked the Crown, because I was appearing as an agent for a friend, what's the difference if David puts forth these arguments or a lawyer, because the Crown was opposed to me appearing as an agent. And the Crown Prosecutor, uh, Peter Francis, stood up and he said, well, he said, officers are lawyers of the court, and as such, or sorry, lawyers are officers of the court, and he said, as such, there are certain arguments and issues we can't put to the court. Hmm. And the whole gallery just gasped, and the judge got really angry at the Crown. Is that because they're part of the Bar Society, or is that something Partially, else? and partially because of their oaths, Yeah. and partially because they're a member of the Law Society, yeah, and they've, they've got certain things that they will not argue. And for people uh, such as us who are involved in freedom issues, primarily their oath of allegiance says they have to uh, be allegiant to Her Majesty and protect her. So they will do what it takes to protect the Queen, even if she breaks her oath. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're not going to win in those courts. So all of them, they're all their agents for Her Majesty. And they're not going to uh, take away her money supply. And I guess as another uh, repercussion, as I told the judge in my case, I said no matter how much we are correct, no matter how much I am correct, you will never let me win for one Jeez. reason only. And he said, what's that? And I said, the minute I win, within a week, a quarter of a million people will be out of a job. CRA officials, tax court officials, judges, all their support staff, the cleaning people at all the buildings, all the, uh, everybody that supplies books and paper to them, the accountants, the lawyers, all across Canada Amazing. will be out of a job. And I said, you will not let that happen. And he, he, just, he just looked at me and he smiled. And he said, Mr. Lindsay, just keep going. No denial. No, 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 Mr. Lindsay, if you, if you can prove that income tax is wrong, I will rule in your favor. Nothing. He just, a really, really cocky, smirky smile and said, Mr. Lindsay, continue. And uh, the fact is, we, won't, we will never win in the courts. They're, they're too corrupted. Okay, well then that brings us to our, I guess, I guess our final point, which is the solutions. Uh, at Freedom Free For All, we are changevictoria.org. We're heavily into solutions. Um, we do talk about a lot of the problems because uh, problem assessment is 90% of finding the solution. Um, but solutions are important because it gets you thinking on the right track. So if we can't win in court, where is our remedy found or how can we win? Or what is the process of winning freedom um, from um, unlawful search and seizure and taking of our property? How, how is it possible? What's, what's the remedy? Well, ultimately, they've got the guns. And I was at the firearms reference case in Edmonton for a week when they did it. And the case, the questions that the lawyers put to the court were designed in a manner that they would get the answers they wanted, which was to lose. It was, it was a setup because we do have a constitutional right to bear arms in Canada. And it comes from our common law, which existed going back to the size of arms in 1187 and even further back than that. Wow. But putting that aside, they, they've taken our right to, wait, to bear arms away right now. So we've got no way of defending it. And if they want to bust into your house and search, they're going to do it. The best thing we can do is, A, to make yourself judgment proof. Get everything out of your name. It takes 3% of the people to make a solution. You don't need everybody in society doing it. So if one person, in the, one man or woman in the family can look after the finances and get everything out of their name, then you made a solution. Get joint bank accounts. Um, get automobiles out of your name. Don't use the banks. 
if you can't. If you have to use well, a joint bank possible, account. Though? Like you can't cash checks, you can't, it's, it's next to impossible to live without a bank, right? Well, Isn't let me it? rephrase that. Don't have an interest bearing bank account because it, in and interest is taxable. Yeah. And use them in a way where you get your check, you cash it and you keep the cash. So don't store the money in the bank. Don't for store the money in the bank. If it's in the bank, you're going to lose it at some point. Yeah. And if it's anywhere where they can attach it, you're going to lose it. Yeah. Nothing is foolproof. There is no foolproof method, foolproof method in Canada of of uh, making sure they don't come after you. Um, what we teach is to work on a community basis. Mm -hmm. If you try to work on a national basis, it's almost impossible, either due to our size and the, the amount of resources that, that it takes to network across Canada. But we're teaching people, and we're going to start teaching it even more effectively next year in, in the final part of our tour, that people have to work on a community basis. If you have enough people in your community who are saying, listen, what you're doing is wrong, we're not filing, we're not paying, mm -hmm. They don't have the resources to deal with that in that level. And that's all that matters because if you're in, um, wherever, say in Calgary, for example, who cares what the resources are in Regina? Yeah. What happens in Calgary is where they have to, they have to deal with it. They can't say, well, you've been charged Calgary, Calgary and Calgary is all booked up in the courts, so we're going to ship you off to Regina. You can't do that. So we're going to teach people how the courts work, what to look, look out for, and how to stop filing by putting Her Majesty on notice that what she has done is a violation of her coronation oath, which, it's not my words, but it's a word of half a dozen of English as greatest judges, is a contract. That it's oath a is contract. a contract. A social contract? Or? Well, it's the, funda the wording was fundamental contract. That's what starts the relationship between the Queen being able to pass statutes that we agree to be bound by. Yes. And she's broken that oath. She's broken that contract. And that's what we tell people, contract law applies to it as well. Here's how you can get out of it, and here's how and why contract applies and what you can do. Mm -hmm. We put them on notice. We're not participating. And how we're not participating is we refuse to be a person. And a person is legally defined as a man with a capacity for rights and duties. Capacity is defined as power. And power is defined as the ability to affect legal relations. Hmm. And you can't break it down any more than that. So the definition really means a man who has the power to decide if he's going to take the rights and duties in the act. If he's going to take the if rights he's and going to take so it's the subjective intention first. Absolutely. Right, right at the beginning. Do you want the rights and duties? And the, the thing is, when you talk about, as you said earlier, your fair share, the benefits are in the act, not exterior to it. That's right. For example, you don't look in the Motor Vehicle Act to see what your duties are in the Income Tax Act. That's right. It says in this act. It says in this act. Yeah. So your duties are in the act. The benefits are in the act. What the crown or anybody does with the money when they get it is none of your business. Mm -hmm. and, and you have no say in the matter. So if you take any of the benefits in the Income Tax Act, then you're liable to do the duties. That and that's sense. what we try and tell people. Don't accept the benefits in the act. Don't take any of the duties in the act. And tell, here's your notice to the queen. And we give samples of notices they can send in that I sent in. S send them right to the queen. I'm not a person in the act, you broke your contract, I'm out. And you have a right, to, constitutional right as well to do that. And we try and tell people to, to do that. But it's going to take people on a local level to about 3% mm -hmm. to start making the change. But the most important thing behind everything is going to be intention. intention. If your goal is simply to go out and make a buck, we don't want you. Mm -hmm. And you're going to do a lot more harm than anything. The goal has to be your system is corrupt. The money system at source has been compromised and it's completely criminal. Usury is prohibited in our law and it should never have been brought in. The debt can never get paid. It's a fraud. Mm -hmm. Eliminate it and you eliminate income tax. Wow. And then people are, are generally happy when they can keep the fruits of the labor. 80% of everything you pay is interest and taxes. Yes. And I've told people, you look at a dollar thirty for a liter of gas. Mm -hmm. Take eighty percent out of that, from the time the shovel first goes in and, and to get the oil out and everything else until they produce the gas. Take eighty percent out of that, and you'd be paying what twenty, thirty cents a liter. And then try and tell people there's an oil shortage in the world. Yeah. And people will realize the fraud behind that that assumption or that allegation that's made. So that's our eventual our goal starting uh, next year. Right now we're on an educational tour. Mm -hmm. Here's the knowledge you need to know why and how income tax is unlawful. Mm -hmm. 
And we still haven't even gotten into the BNA Act yet yeah. as to why it's unlawful there. But here's what you need to start at a fundamental level, why it's unlawful. Next year is going to be, now that you got the information, now that you understand it, and you've had it like six months to a year to start getting everything out of your name and making yourself judgment proof, mm -hmm. now we start taking action. Stop filing and don't support these people. And I can show you constitutionally, and I will show everybody, the specific law that says you do not have to pay income tax. Compelling. And I will show that. That's compelling. And I look, uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing your, your first part here. And apparently you will be coming back in 2014, maybe yes. the springtime yep. soon. So I guess the viewers can, by all means, feel free to check out wearechangevictoria.org on a regular basis yes. or freedomfreeforall.com and see when you're coming back and so that they can get that part of it as well. I also know that you have DVDs that you sell, which is this exact seminar. So for those that can't attend it, they will be able to buy that DVD off of you. And what we're going to do at Freedom Free For All is we're going to, um, actually, we are changevictoria.org. You can come and uh, you can visit the website. You can buy this DVD package. We'll have it on our site. And uh, if there's any other information you want, just feel free to Google us at uh, freedomfreeforall at gmail.com. Um, so I guess the solutions part is A, educating yourself. Yes. Educating yourself on what the law really is. Mm -hmm. Um, educating yourself on what the courts have said and what the authorities in the past have said. Um, another solution would be to talk to people, to converse with people about it, break those barriers, those memes, those social conduct conditioning that we've all been kind of mm. told, you know, how will a country run? You need a SIN number to work, which is right. very That's not right. true. It's true. Um, um, and that basically it's, it's all about taking that time to invest in yourself. Because at the end of the day, if you don't invest in yourself and you export your energy and you export your authority, you're most likely going to have someone that stomps on you and, and, and abuses you at the end of the day, right? So um, I look forward to that extra, that, that another seminar that you have there. Awesome. And uh, is there anywhere specifically that people can get more information about you or... Um, or we, we where don't people have a, can contact you, an email address or something? Yeah, our website's still in progress. But we have our email address, which is clear, C-L-E-A-R, at clearfreedom.org. And so they can contact you if there's any questions about that's that. That's correct, and, yeah. Well, that's awesome. Um, I want to thank you so much for being on our show here and having the time to talk about this because uh, if it wasn't for shows like this, I don't think the people would ever really get to hear firsthand knowledge of what you're actually doing and what you're presenting. Rather, they would have the media tell them, how much of a bad guy you are and how you're linked to Al-Qaeda and all these other things that are so not true. And yes. So I want to appreciate you coming. Is there anything yeah. last that you want to say on, on behalf of uh, yourself or Clear? Or? Um, I just want to emphasize to people they have to not only educate themselves, but education, they, they have to understand it. And that takes a little bit of time. And that's the same with all freedom issues. So they, they have to understand what, what, what we're teaching as well. So we, we tell people don't rush out and I think it's going to happen overnight. Take your time. We spent a decade or more to get this information. All you need to do is either watch the DVDs, get the information and read it, and take a few months to understand it. And um, I, I agree with what you said, though. If it wasn't for shows like this, we wouldn't be able to get our information out, and they would be continu continuously misrepresented in, in national mainstream media. Yeah. And we are people such as myself and others are really indebted it's people such as you who are able to get this out and, and do the work for us to be able to, to talk and get it out to people, and I'm, I'm very grateful. Thank you. That's great. Well, thanks for coming on the show, David. Yeah, you bet. We've been uh, talking with David Kevin Lindsay here on Freedom Free For All TV. Uh, I'm Paul from WeAreChangeVictoria.org, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks again.